Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Circle and circle and circle and you can't find a spot. You think you have one, it looks pretty good. You pull up to it and there's a motorcycle. So finally frustrated, you say, God, if you give me a good spot, I'll throw $100 in the offering on Sunday and suddenly, to your surprise, backup lights come on in the car just next to the motorcycle and they begin to back up. You pull into the spot, what do you say? Never mind, Lord, I took care of it myself. <laughs> kind of silly, maybe, but very serious, isn't it? Because so often people will pray, but then when God answers their prayers, what often happens? They may discount it as a coincidence. Oh, it just happened to go that way. And they forget that, in fact, God not only hears the prayers of his people, but he answers them as well. You may have heard similar stories about prayer in the past. Unfortunately, we oftentimes leave prayer as something of last resort, don't we? It's not always the first thing that is on our list when we need something. We're running short of groceries. The paycheck hasn't come. What do we do? The first thing is we check the checkbook. What happens if we actually started by turning to God? That would be something wonderful. You know, God does say that we should pray, and he does say that uh, whatever we ask in his name with confidence, he will hear, and he will answer it for us according to his good and gracious will in our lives. Today, in this little reading, the parable of the fig tree, we see Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for. Interesting. If you believe, you will receive. Sounds a little incredible, doesn't it? Is it true? Well, let's talk about the background of what's going on here. Of course, it's early now in Holy Week. Jesus is on his way, having spent his evening in the community of Bethany just outside of the city of Jerusalem. He's walking into town. Fig trees oftentimes in the Bible, you probably have noted, represent the city of the people of Israel. But whenever a fig tree leaves, the fruit is right there as well. They come simultaneously. So when Jesus spies a fig tree on the way into Jerusalem, he figures it's time for breakfast. There's supposed to be fruit there. He walks up to the tree, it's lush and green, and he finds nothing. It looks like it should have fruit. It certainly appears to be healthy, but it has nothing to offer him. He cursed the fig tree. May you never have figs again. And immediately it withered and died. How interesting, isn't it? Is this a story to teach us that Jesus will work out his anger and frustration on nature? No, not at all. What is it about? Well, it's an example, isn't it? A reminder for Peter and Philip and those who are standing there with Jesus. What is a reminder of? Well, think back to some of the things that they had experienced with Jesus. Do you remember them out on the lake in the midst of a storm? In a boat? Jesus was asleep in the rear. They woke him up. They were terrified. And with a word, he said, silence. And the storm stopped. Now that's power. And then of course there's on the shore of that same lake a little boy sack lunch of a few pieces of bread and fish which suddenly feed thousands of people with leftovers to pick up. That's power. There's also the incidents and the miracles that we can recount throughout Galilee and even into Judea. 
The words of Jesus himself are the words of power. Jesus commands today these dry, withered leaves of the fig tree, even nature, and that is power. God's word is power. It's wondrous. It's amazing. So here you're starting with the fig tree. You're staring at the fig tree. Your eyes are wide open. You're taking it all in. And Jesus redirects your thinking. You think, wow, that's amazing. And he tells you to look at the mountains. And he tells you, if you say this even to this mountain, it will be in the midst of the sea. So if you're Philip or Peter, do you believe him? Absolutely. Because you've seen the power of Jesus. His word is life-giving power. You don't doubt him for a second. Why? Because you've seen what he can do. You've seen the power of God at work. And that's the key when it comes to unlocking these beautiful and comforting words of Jesus. I tell you the truth. It's all too often we hear the words, if you have faith, right? If you believe, the emphasis is on you, but is it really where Jesus put the emphasis? I don't think so. Where does it belong? Jesus is making a true statement, and it's knowing the power of the one who makes the promise wherein the power lies. Not in you, not in your faith, but in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I tell you the truth, he says, faith can move mountains. His power and his promise make prayer effective. His power and his promise make prayer effective. And that's where it's at. Now, how, is it impor how important is it to remember, especially in the season of Lent, the power of Christ? As our hymns go into minor keys, as our alleluias are temporarily put away for a time, as all of the repentance and the confession and such words are brought up again and again in worship and devotion, how important is it to remember where the power lies? Extremely important. Because you see, while this season of confession is valuable for magnifying the love of our Lord for you and I, there's also a danger there, isn't there? As we see our hands swinging the hammer and driving in the nails, in this Lenten season once again, as we hear our voices shouting with mockery at the Son of God, as we stand in the crowds, we can easily find despair. Because what kind of a believer am I? What kind of faith do I have if not everything I ask for happens just the way I want it? And that, of course, are the words that come from the father of lies. He is right there as once he was at the cross, so now he stands near us, trying to redirect our focus from the source of power and onto ourselves. And we hear that all around us, and he uses these things to shake our faith. I prayed for my grandfather to get well, but he didn't. My faith must not be that good. I pray that my marriage would survive and now I have signed divorce papers in front of me. I must have doubted God somewhere along the line because he didn't give me what I wanted. I believed I could get the job but I didn't even get offered. And on and on and on it goes. Our faith gets shaken and maybe we start to wonder, do I really do I really believe it? Or do I believe enough for Jesus to give me 
what I want. But in either case, we turn faith into a work and not something that is a gift of God from the power, the source of power, Jesus himself. So, Jesus' point, this Lenten path, is not whether or not he can make a mountain fall into the middle of the sea. The God who with a word created all things can certainly do something as insignificant as that, can't he? He is that powerful. And the disciples, through prayer, could tap into that divine power. What a loving thing to teach his disciples in the final week before his death. That they have access to God and that God hears their prayers. Now, what a loving thing, yes. But... In a few days, Jesus was going to be arrested. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be crucified at the hands of ungodly men. And undoubtedly, their faith would be shaken to its core. Yet, they could still go back to the tree on the way to Bethany and remember what Jesus had done and what he had said. They would remember his conversation they would remember his power. They could be reminded that he didn't die, you see, out of any of his own weakness or because someone had outsmarted him, but that he died on his own accord. As a result, they could have faith, mountain-moving faith in the Son of God. Would they always remember that? No. Neither do we. Because, you see, if they did, Peter wouldn't be hiding in the darkness and collapsing when a servant girl questions him. They wouldn't be huddled afraid in a locked room after the crucifixion waiting to find out what was going to happen to them. But no matter how they felt or how they acted, Jesus' statement remained, I tell you the truth. You tell this mountain to fall into the sea, and it will be done. And the same goes for us, doesn't it? This Lenten season. Suffering, never mistake, never mistake it for a weakness, because it is not. Through the eyes of Scripture, we've seen Jesus do more than collapse mountains, do more than toss them into the sea, do more than simply wither a tree. We saw Jesus in the Gospels face Satan for 40 days and nights in the wilderness and come out un untarnished, without sin. That's power. We'll see in the weeks ahead that the Savior God will do many wonderful things. He will take a severed ear and reattach it to the high priest's servant. And that's power. We'll see Jesus at the Last Supper taking the typical outward forms of bread and wine and by a miraculous power of his own combining in with and under that bread and wine the very body and blood that he would offer to them on the cross. That's power. We'll see the Savior God crushing the head of the serpent Satan from the cross when he says, for all the world to hear, it is finished. And that's power. We'll see our Savior God open his robe to his disciple and tell him to poke his finger into his side to feel his bones, to put his finger in the nail marks. Stop doubting and believe. And he does. And that's power. We'll see the Son of God ascend to the right hand of the Father in heaven to judge the living and the dead. And that is all power. And now today, he asks you and I to tap into that power of prayer. Not as a last resort, not as a desperate plea, although that's certainly fine, if it is that. But primarily as a blessing of God for you. Reserved just for you and me as his 
faithful disciples because of our place as children in the Father's family. Well, I'm not saying we won't forget that at times. We do. We always will. At times we'll cower under questions and at times, no matter what, we will fear the changes and the facts around us. No matter how weak need we feel, though, one fact will remain. I tell you the truth. Your faith can move mountains. Because your faith depends not on you, but on the source of faith, Jesus Christ, your Savior. He is the one who withers the tree. He is the one who defeats death. He is the one who conquers sin. He is the one who squelches the power of Satan. And like the disciples, may that lead you and I this Lenten season to be amazed. May that lead us to fall to our knees. And as we have been invited, to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.